Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this masterclass about learning in cancer-associated thrombosis. And we have an absolute treat for you today with uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jean Connors, who's from uh, Harvard, and uh, she's um, uh, been an expert on thrombosis uh, for a long, long time, and we've worked together on a number of projects, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Jean to talk on a subject that she is a, a true expert, and that is the management of cancer-associated thrombosis. She's going to talk about the latest research, and she's going to discuss both treatment and prophylaxis. And uh, Professor Connors is also not just a, an expert in thrombosis, but she's um, a, a jobbing physician hematologist. She sees a lot of patients. She works with oncology and oncologist departments, and she's involved in a lot of the esteemed societies and journals, and also uh, a lot of uh, advisory boards. And so uh, we're delighted to have you, Jean. And uh, uh, if you may, please start your lecture and, uh, and uh, please share your slides with us. Well, thank you, Ander. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be invited um, it, to, to give this presentation that I've titled Cancer Associated Thrombosis, Current and Future Treatment Strategies. And, and I wanna thank Thrombosis UK uh, for inviting me to, to give this presentation. I have a few disclosures that you just briefly saw for less than a second. Um, so my agenda in the next 45 minutes or so, leaving time for discussion, is to discuss um, very briefly the risks for cancer associated VTE, venous thromboembolism, and then really get into the weeds a bit about treatment of acute VTE, what to do when you're first presented with a patient who has cancer associated thrombosis and the treatment for the six months, and then what to do after six months with these patients. I'll then move on to primary prophylaxis to prevent cancer-associated VTE. And during this time, I'll bring up some new strategies that we can use to care for our patients to either treat or prevent cancer-associated thrombosis. So this is um, a nice uh, a, a cartoon actually uh, developed by Alok Karana and colleagues and published in a Nature Review this year um, looking at the downstream effects when a patient develops cancer-associated venous thromboembolism. Now, patients with cancer have an increased risk of thrombosis, and we've known that for many, many years. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, although Vercal is the reason we celebrate uh, World Thrombosis Day on October 13th, um, Trousseau actually in the mid-1800s recognized the association of cancer with thrombosis. 20% to 30% of all VTE that we diagnose uh, throughout the year are, occur in patients who have cancer. Uh, cancer patients have a one in seven risk of developing thrombosis. And this is associated with increased morbidity and mortality as seen in, in this uh, cartoon here with all kinds of uh, increase in costs, increase in prolonged need for a therapeutic anticoagulation, which increases the risk of bleeding, as I'll show you, uh, increased utilization of healthcare systems, uh, and increase in, in short-term mortality and worsened overall survival. Though one of the most important things for patients when they're newly diagnosed with VTE is how the VTE will impact uh, their anti-cancer treatment. And often we see delays or interruptions. And so cancer is really a chronic disease now for many patients, thanks to increased um, improvements in cancer treatments. Uh, and so the cumulative incidence of VTE uh, in, has increased as well. And so this, this is a, a slide um, Chian I uh, and colleagues uh, wrote in, in a review about mechanisms of cancer-associated VTE. Uh, and we could spend just an hour on this alone, um, looking at all of the factors that go into the development of thrombosis in patients with cancer. So it's not just venous compression by the tumor, uh, as is seen in some patients and in, in, in meets Verkhaus triad, but also humoral and, and cellular factors that, that are activated to result 
uh, in thrombosis. And as we as can be seen in this um, uh, these graphs uh, from Mulder and colleagues uh, published in Blood in 2021, there's been an, in an increase in the incidence uh, in every decade since the late 1990s of, of diagnosis of VTE in patients with cancer, as seen in the red line, compared to patients who don't or the public that doesn't have cancer. Um, is seen in the bottom. This is a, a registry uh, study uh, from uh, a Danish country. And you can see that, you know, there, there are many postulated reasons for this. Some of them are chemotherapy and targeted treatments, um, which have different degrees of associated risk. Um, there's also a better detection, which I think anybody in the VTE world recognizes that CT scanners today are far improved compared to where they were 20 and 30 uh, years ago. Now, in this, um, I show this slide, uh, which was um, uh, developed by Gary Lyman and colleagues over uh, a decade ago, because this has not really changed. And this is the risk of VTE during the natural history, if you will, of a patient with cancer. And so the risk is increased at the time of diagnosis and hospitalization in particular, you know, immobilization, surgery uh, may occur during this time, and then the initiation of chemotherapy. And as chemotherapy progresses and, and hopefully the patient enters remission, the risk at that time drops. But if the patient has recurrence um, and metastatic disease, then this risk increases and in some patients that never drops. And so this is the, the increased risk uh, uh, overall in the cancer population with an odds ratio of about four compared to the risk in the general population. And so I keep this timeline in mind when I'm treating the individual patient uh, in front of me that has cancer and has had a VTE or in, I'm approached about whether they would benefit from prophylaxis. And so what's great in the last uh, decade, 15 years even, um, is uh, there's been significant improvement and, and the pace of development of anticoagulants has really uh, improved. Um, you know, heparin was uh, identified uh, and, and available for treatment in the 1940s. It was actually identified much earlier than that in 1916. Um, and then warfarin um, or vitamin K antagonists in the 1950s. And these were the mainstay of treatments um, for over 30, 40 years until low molecular weight heparins were developed, um, but they weren't available in the United States until the early 1990s. We have the development of the direct thrombin inhibitors, but again, some delay in getting them out into general use. Fondaparinux uh, was approved uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, this is a, a recombinant uh, five pentasaccharide sequence uh, that's important for uh, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, that sequence that binds to antithrombin. But there's been an explosion in the oral anticoagulants, the ones that we call direct uh, oral anticoagulants, unlike warfarin. Um, and this has really benefited not only the general population, but our patients with cancer. And this is where, what I'm going to focus on uh, for treatment in the next few uh, slides. However, we now have some the exciting promise of factor 11 inhibitors, uh, it, which may be able to uh, prevent thrombosis. They've certainly been demonstrated to prevent thrombosis uh, as prophylaxis in, in certain clinical indications in phase two trials. Um, and, and right now there are phase three trials going on to treat cancer. And the hope is that the factor 11 inhibitors uh, can prevent pathologic thrombosis, but allow normal hemostasis and decrease bleeding. More about that soon. So treatment of acute VTE um, for the last uh, 15 or even longer years has been based on low molecular weight heparin, uh, which is considered, has been considered the gold standard treatment for acute VTE based on the CLOT trial data um, published by Aggie Lee and colleagues uh, in 2003, in which patients randomized to daltaparin had significantly less risk or lower risk of recurrent VTE compared to patients treated with warfarin. 
and then I manage services of, uh, that treat patients with warfarin, and I would love to get into the weeds about what's happening early on here. It's very hard to manage warfarin in patients who have cancer and they're getting chemotherapy, which affects the metabolism. Now, so one, this was a study that went out to six months. One thing that I want to point out to people is that daltaparin, because of this trial, um, has been approved as monotherapy for new treatment of acute VTE in patients with cancer uh, in the United States, North America, and, and Europe, and the rest of the world. The dose of daltaparin was actually decreased from the full 100% dose during the first month to 75% after one month. And at the time the study was designed, there was anxiety that people would not enroll their patients because of concern for bleeding with these new low molecular weight heparins. This may play a role in, in the differences we see in bleeding uh, between DOAX and low molecular weight heparin. There are 10A inhibitors, the, the direct oral anticoagulants that inhibit factor 10A, apixaban, adoxaban, and rivaroxaban, have compare, been compared with daltaparin in large phase three randomized, control, randomized controlled trials. The Hokusai VTE cancer trial, the SELECT-D trial, the Caravaggio trial, which Ander and I both worked on. Um, and they, um, in those trials, uh, the uh, 10A inhibitors were found to be non-inferior to daltaparin. I'm gonna show you um, briefly data from a trial that we just published, although we completed enrollment in March of 2020, um, where was, this was a pragmatic effectiveness trial. And so in this trial, Deb Schrag and I as the co-chairs um, randomized participants um, to DOAC versus standard of care, low molecular weight heparin in most situations, a few patients on Fonda Paranox, 6% actually had to move to warfarin because in the United States, the price of low molecular weight heparin can be prohibitive. And so what made this a pragmatic effectiveness trial? You know, we talk about real world data. Well, this is um, real world data on steroids, if you will, because we're actually randomizing patients to these two different groups. Uh, we had more inclusive eligibility criteria with regard to renal function and, and platelet count. But the trial was really designed to emulate real world practice. There was no strict guidance to dosing. So participants um, and their um, provider, once they were randomized, could pick the DOAC that was suitable for them, including in the US what, it's, what insurance covered, but also uh, they could adjust the dose based on patient factors. We advise them to adhere to the package insert, but, but this was real world practice. If the patient needed procedures during the six months of treatment, um, the, there were, were um, the physicians would follow local guidance as to how long to hold pre-procedure and when to restart. And so what we found is, is that uh, DOAC as a class uh, were non-inferior for the prevention of recurrent VTE. There was no difference in major bleeding between the DOAC group and the standard of care based on the pragmatic approach that clinicians used. Um, I will say that um, we analyzed you know, the types of uh, DOACs uh, almost 60% were prescribed apixaban uh, and the rest uh, rivaroxaban uh, in the DOAC arm. There were maybe 10 to 20 patients treated with dabigatran and one or two treated with adoxaban. Um, so what we did find as well, and, and this is not surprising, we had a lot of quality of life evaluations. Um, I think some of the instruments that we use to assess quality of life for anticoagulation are not geared to DOAC. We found no difference in those instruments between those on DOAC versus standard of care. But at the end of six months, 11% of participants um, had better adherence to DOAC with, with longer duration of, of staying on, on assigned treatment than those uh, assigned to standard of care. And so you can see um, with regard to recurrent VTE, which was the primary outcome, DOAC were non-inferior for preventing recurrent VTE. Now, as I sort of hinted at, this was not at all statistically significant here, but in all the trials, uh, there is a hint uh, that's not been significant in any of them. None of them have reached superiority, that DOAC may actually be a little bit better um, at preventing recurrence. 
whether it's due to increased adherence or whether it's due to the fact that we dropped to 75% dose uh, in, in, in the real in the Delta Parin phase three trials is not clear. What I will say is that the majority of participants in this United States CANVAS trial used uh, enoxaparin and used full dose. So again, there, there is something uh, there. However, we saw no difference in, in major bleeding. We're still analyzing uh, duration of treatment and changes in dose, but uh, there is no significant difference there in bleeding. And so using these data, uh, Corinne Frere, uh, from France and I um, and other colleagues uh, performed meta-analysis, uh, look combining all the trial data uh, that we had uh, in that were randomized. Uh, we have the Hawkesai VTE cancer trial, which enrolled uh, oh, just over a thousand uh, participants. Select D Hawkesai was a doxaban. Select D four hundred and six randomized uh, to rivaroxaban or low molecular weight heparin. Uh, Adam VTE, where the primary outcome was safety, 300 participants randomized to apixaban versus uh, uh, dalteparin, uh, and uh, no uh, no real difference in, in safety there, no safety signal, and Caravaggio, which which enrolled almost 1,200 participants, Castadiva, a small study performed uh, in France. And then Canvas, uh, in which we enrolled uh, close to 700 participants. And so what we can see from this uh, meta-analysis, looking at the primary efficacy outcome, um, just looking at the bottom line here, is that when we perform this meta-analysis, um, we find that to prevent recurrent VTE, DOAC are favored compared to low molecular weight heparin with a difference of almost 3%. Um, and in a significant risk reduction. When we look at primary safety outcome, however, major bleeding, we are just about at one. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss uh, Hawkesai VTE and Select D in a minute, because you can see that in those trials, low molecular weight heparin was favored, whereas in Caravaggio and Castadiva and Canvas, um, the DOACs uh, were favored. What's also become uh, important for us uh, as we improve uh, on anticoagulant use, and, and we again, we've made great strides with using DOACs, not only in the general population, but also in patients with cancer, is that clinically relevant non-major bleeding becomes important. Uh, because uh, this is bleeding that brings patients to, att to medical attention and can be significantly anxiety provoking, can cause uh, other medical interventions. We're talking about nose bleeding, hematuria, rectal bleeding, other types of bleedings that, that are concerning. Uh, and while we used to focus just on major bleeding, we recognize that CRNMB uh, is, is important. And in this situation, the low molecular weight heparins were favored in almost all trials. And so this is something that the field is now going to pay attention to. Is there something we can do about clinically relevant non-major bleeding, uh, which has a, a, a difference of almost 4% uh, in using DOAC uh, compared to low molecular weight heparin? So um, a sub-analysis of Hawkesai VTE cancer is shown here in a, in a secondary publication. And, and the SELECT-D trial, about halfway through, this was rivaroxaban compared to low molecular weight heparin performed by Annie Young and colleagues in the UK. Halfway through the trial, the Data Safety Monitoring Board um, made a statement that said uh, they should no longer enroll patients with upper GI tract malignancies those with esophageal or gastric cancers, because they were seeing an increased risk of bleeding in those uh, treated with rivaroxaban compared to those treated with dalteparin. So that um, had some impact on the major bleeding outcome. When we look at Hawkesai VTE cancer and we look at the major bleeds, there were 32 major bleeds in the adoxaban group. 22 out of those 32 were GI tract bleeds compared to dalteparin, which had 16 major bleeds and only five of the 16 were GI bleeds. 
And when you break down the bleeds by um, a cancer type, you can see in the bottom, if you take all non-GI tract cancers, there's no difference between adoxaban and daltaparin, and you don't even need to know which one is which in these, these colored lines. But when you look at the top slide um, or the top graph, you can see that adoxaban, sorry, uh, blue line, there's a significant increase in major bleeding in those with GI tract cancers compared to daltaparin. Um, and compared to those that have non-GI tract cancers. So we can actually identify these patients um, and, and use caution in, in some of those um, with a GI tract malignancies. Um, I'm not sure if I included a slide here um, that discusses um, the, the possible etiology, um, but, but to summarize, uh, uh, DOAC use in patients uh, to treat cancer-associated VTE, apixaban, adoxaban, and rivaroxaban in all of those trials and in Canvas, um, the co composite DOAC 10A inhibitors were not inferior to daltaparin or to standard of care low molecular weight heparin to prevent re recurrent VTE. Just remember that adoxaban requires, based on the package label, a five-day lead-in with low molecular weight heparin. This increased signal of major bleeding is seen with adoxaban and rivaroxaban in GI tract uh, uh, tumor patients, patients who have GI tract malignancies and GI bleeding. Um, there's um, data that support that those with intact luminal primaries, so those somebody with colon cancer or particularly gastric or esophageal, where the tumor is still there and, and patients are getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy to try to shrink the tumor before resecting it, those patients may be at increased risk for major bleeding. I will tell you in my daily practice, patients who have other GI tract pathologies, such as diverticulosis that is prone to bleeding, um, can develop more severe bleeding when they're treated with uh, an oral uh, 10A inhibitor because they have an increased concentration of that anticoagulant in the gut compared to, say, using VKA or using low molecular weight heparin where there's no active drug in the gut lumen. Um, we did not see an increase in major bleeding in patients with GI cancers uh, treated with apixaban, and this held up in the CANVAS trial in which 60% of patients uh, were uh, uh, assigned uh, apixaban by their local investigator. So apixaban may have a wider spectrum of use in cancer patients in terms of safety, but careful consideration and selection of patients is required uh, with adoxaban or rivaroxaban, and, and to some degree, even apixaban, depending on what's going on with the patient. So for acute management of cancer-associated VTE, uh, I, I use this slide frequently um, with my medical oncology colleagues, uh, and I'm glad to see there's been a shift in approach, and I'll discuss that. The severity of thrombosis affects initial treatment decisions. So 10A inhibitors and low molecular weight heparin are equally recommended by all societies as first-line treatments and interchangeable with basically a 1A uh, level of recommendation uh, or similar from most uh, uh, oncology societies, the ISTH, uh, ITAC, uh, and others. Um, I want to stress that PE can be treated as an outpatient if the patient is hemodynamically stable and there's no consideration for thrombolysis. And we here in Boston may have been slow to catch on to this, unlike the rest of the world, uh, but I've had medical oncologists call me up uh, prior, to, prior to COVID and say, hey, you know, my patient was just diagnosed with PE on imaging. Um, he is end stage. He has dinner plans. The radiologist is saying, I need to send him to the emergency department and admit him. Do I really need to do that? And the answer is no, as long as you can make sure that the patient can obtain the drug in a timely fashion um, if you're going to treat the patient as an outpatient. And I have seen patients sent to me in clinic who are said to have failed, although the patient never fails, um, but have progressed through anticoagulation. And when you talk to them, you find out that their local pharmacy did not have the prescribed drug and they had to wait three days to get it. So do make sure if you're sending your patient home with an acute VTE that you can actually, they can obtain the drug. 
Um, we transition between low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin, and DOACs all the time, and I'm happy to discuss how we do that. For some situations, um, acute kidney injury, significantly elevated creatinine with, with reduced uh, creatinine clearance or EGFR down below 20, um, uh, low molecular weight heparin may be better because you can actually measure levels and titrate both the dose and the interval um, to, to give adequate uh, therapeutic levels without increasing excessive bleeding. This is also uh, true for those with uh, severe liver disease uh, or acute hepatic failure. As I've discussed, acute uh, GI tract issues um, it need to be uh, assessed. Uh, absorption and bleeding uh, can be concerned. Um, I'm the medical director of an anti-coag service at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We have patients who with chemo have increased GI tract bleeding. We switch them to a low molecular weight heparin. Uh, at the time they're getting, say, their every 28 day chemo uh, and then switch them back to a DOAC. So lots of creative ways that are completely off label that can be addressing this. And you know, drug-drug interactions need to be considered for DOACs. Um, looking at strong inhibitors or induces a P-glycoprotein transporter or C CYP3A4. And, and this, if for the most part, these interactions are theoretical. Um, we, we assume that a 30% change in uh, estimated change in plasma concentration may uh, affect the efficacy or safety. We need more data on this. Uh, Tsufei Wang and colleagues uh, from Canada have a lot of uh, great uh, reviews on, on this topic. And so um, the acute management of cancer-associated VTE not, needs to take into consideration the bleeding risk and the bleeding sites, uh, which may affect anticoagulant choice. As I've discussed in detail, patients with GI cancers um, had increased risk of major bleeding with some of the DOACs compared to low molecular weight heparin. We also see this, however, in patients with GU tract tumors, uh, bladder uh, cancer, uh, renal cancer, uh, ureteral stents in place, uh, you know, metastatic disease that's invading um, is also associated with increased bleeding uh, with DOAC, but we also see this with low molecular weight heparin. And, and when you look at the composition, the types of tumors enrolled in these trials, very few patients with GU tract tumors have been enrolled in the large major uh, phase three RCTs. Thrombocytopenia, when we talk about acute management, um, I will reach for low molecular weight heparin for patients with you know the platelet count of uh, 21,000 in an acute PE in the middle of stem cell transplant because it has a six hour half-life compared with 12 uh, on average for uh, apixaban and rivaroxaban. And we keep in mind that those patients who um, have what we would consider mild to moderate sites of bleeding, uh, nose bleeding, uterine bleeding, um, this there's sort of certainly GU tract and GI, clinically relevant non-major bleeds may increase with a DOAC compared to low molecular weight heparin. So I'm going to, um, in the next two slides, discuss common management problems very briefly. We see recurrent VTE frequently. These patients get hospitalized, hematology gets consulted, um, and these are usually patients with advanced stage cancer. Uh, and so I, I advise you to assess for common factors if someone has said to have been on a DOAC or even low molecular weight heparin at standard therapeutic dose, and they have recurrent or breakthrough clots. For the oral anticoagulants it, it, and, and for, for the parenteral ones, adherence for both of these, you know, making sure that the patient took the drug, making sure that it was not interrupted for procedures. For the DOAX, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, other reasons for poor GI tract absorption, significant resection of large parts of the stomach and intestines, um, all of these uh, can be a factor in, in efficacy. Uh, and uh, so we, we assess patients rigorously for this. Um, when someone does have a management problem and, and develops breakthrough uh, thrombosis, um, we, you know, there are consensus uh, advice guidance documents um, about how to approach this. And in, in I put a table from one that Hani Alsamkari and I wrote for the ASH uh, education sessions in 2019. Uh, there are data from the Canadians 
uh, showing that, you know, if the patient, you know, our approach is if the patient's on a DOAC or an oral agent, we switch to parenteral agent at a same therapeutic dose. But if somebody's on a full dose parenteral agent, uh, data from, from Canada um, suggest and observational data um, that if you increase the dose to 120 or 125 percent, that is often efficacious in most situations. One thing that I have difficulty with is seeing patients, well, they're on a you know, Pixaban, a therapeutic dose, and they had a recurrent clot, so they get moved to Rivaroxaban or vice versa. I think that that may not be an effective strategy uh, in these patients because you're taking one with similar possible reasons for decreased eff efficacy for another with the same decreased reasons. So parenteral agent, uh, even if you just cool them off for a month uh, and then reconsider can be important. We don't really know how to up titrate uh, a direct oral anticoagulant if there's been breakthrough bleeding. There are no data. Could we give, you know, a Pixaban seven and a half milligrams, or could we go to the Rivaroxaban 15 milligram twice a day strategy? Um, no real data, uh, although anecdotal and, and people practice this. Um, I'd be concerned in patients with cancer, given the increased risks that we've seen with DOAX and bleeding. Thrombocytopenia and VTE, as I um, alluded to a few minutes ago, uh, patients with thrombocytopenia can still develop venous thromboembolism. Uh, and so it, there are a lot of considerations uh, that go into deciding whether to anticoagulate, what to anticoagulate with, and how much of that to give. Um, you know, the general guidelines for any patient is that acute thrombosis is more concerning than after someone's been treated for the first 30 days and especially after 12 weeks. If you look at the old ACCP guidance, uh, it, you know, at 2016 and earlier 2012, it, it's advised not to interrupt anticoagulation after DVT and especially PE in the first 12 weeks if you can avoid that. So for these patients, the risk benefit uh, needs to be carefully assessed. Um, there are, again, no real data except published observational data uh, that guide care, um, but consensus expert opinion uh, uh, out derived out of that. I will say that that patients, uh, not patients, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants are all surprised when I suggest giving some dose of anticoagulation, like you could use uh, 40 milligrams of anoxaparin in somebody with a platelet count of 17,000 and a new PE because something is better than nothing. Or, you know, if it's acute and you expect the platelet count to re recover, um, you can transfuse to a platelet count greater than 50,000, which appears to be our magic number based again on limited data. So um, if you face these patients with thrombocytopenia and need for anticoagulation, um, feel free to review, read this review uh, and look at our strategies for, for how we approach uh, for the different anticoagulants and different platelet thresholds. So um, we all talk about treatment uh, for the first six months and guidelines from ASCO, from ESMO, from ITAC, from NCCN and others all discuss uh, six months because most randomized controlled trial data uh, treat up to six months. Uh, and that's where the strength of the data lie. Uh, we advise on treatment after the first six months there are very few studies uh, that are listed here. Uh, Delta CAN was a phase four prospective single arm safety trial, Delta Parin, um, over 12 months that showed a low rate of major bleeding in the single arm. Hawkesi VTE cancer, uh, again, adoxaban versus Delta Parin for 12 months was the initial trial design with a planned uh, six month analysis pre specified. Only 32% of participants who entered were actually evaluable at 12 months. And so hence the strength of the data stop at six months. And so um, some guidelines are silent on recommendations for treatment after six months. Some guidance documents and some guidelines include the advice uh, about the consensus that we have to continue therapeutic dose anticoagulation in the setting of persistent cancer, patients who still have disease, particularly metastatic disease, 
or those who are getting continued cancer treatments. And so the question that has come up it now is after the first six months, can we use reduced intensity DOAC as in Amplify Extension or Einstein Choice Trials? I, I typed out Amplify Extension because we do have some data for this strategy of dropping to the prophylactic dose of apixaban from five twice a day, which is therapeutic, to 2.5 twice a day uh, in patients with malignancy. There was a single arm, uh, there was one published single arm observational trial, uh, sorry, study, um, the CAP study, looking at low dose apixaban uh, after six months of full dose. Um, it, they showed no concerning safety signal. Um, what is interesting is that there was a high spontaneous discontinu discontinuation rate uh, in that. There are two randomized controlled trials that have tested this strategy. Once uh, patients with cancer have had at least six months of therapeutic dose anticoagulation, uh, randomizing to a pixaban two and a half twice a day versus uh, the five milligrams for 12 months uh, after th six months of therapeutic dose. The EVE trial was presented at ISTH in June, uh, whoops, that's 2023. Sorry, a little typo there. Um, and at 12 months, um, there was actually no real difference that was statistically significant, although a little numeric difference in major bleeding plus clinically relevant non-major bleeding and no difference uh, in recurrence VTE. The APICAT trial uh, is ongoing and the trial design is right here. Um, this is a prospective randomized parallel group, double blind, double dummy, non-inferiority clinical trial. Uh, and the schema is similar to that of EVE. Uh, this is ongoing. From what I've recently heard is that they've enrolled their last participant. Uh, and so a year from now, we will look forward uh, to hearing uh, uh, and finding out whether 2.5 twice a day of apixaban is non-inferior uh, compared to the five twice a day and whether there is any improvement in safety. Remember, Eve did not find any difference in bleeding uh, that was significant. So um, what, where does the future lie? Can, can we actually anticoagulate, uh, particularly our patients with cancer, um, without the increase in bleeding uh, that we see? We know that patients with cancer have an increased risk of thrombosis, but it's been shown many times that they also have an increase of, in bleeding on anticoagulation compared to the general population. Um, it, you know, the first statements here are no brainers uh, that anticoagulants significantly reduce the risk of stroke and thromboembolic disease um, and are excellent treatment for acute thrombosis. Factor 11 is a promising new target for the inhibition of pathologic thrombosis development with minimal impairment of physiologic hemostasis. So can we uncouple thrombosis and necessary hemostasis? There was a recent um, yeah, signal uh, using ebilasumab, a factor 11, factor 11A monoclonal antibody that inhibits its activity and brings down the level. Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the trial earlier than planned because comparing ebilasumab to rivaroxaban in patients with moderate to high risk of stroke and atrial fibrillation, uh, ebilasumab had a decreased risk of bleeding. I have no other data, but this, I believe there are plans to uh, present this data at the American Heart uh, Association meeting next month. An antisense oligo, uh, uh, which um, you inject the antisense oligo to RNA, factor 11 is not transcribed in the liver. You knock down the factor 11 levels as with somebody who has congenital factor 11 deficiency showed great proof of principle uh, in a um, knee replacement uh, model. model. Um, it can suppress factor 11 production and compared to low molecular weight heparin had um, a, no you know, similar or even lower rates of development of post total knee replacement uh, thrombo venous thromboembolism in the lower extremity based on venography. However, this is not a practical uh, approach for acute treatment as it takes over a month to reach these low levels. 
The phase two data with abilazumab uh, also show that uh, there is efficacy in the total knee replacement population with no safety signals of, of significant concern. And there are trials now underway using abilazumab, a factor 11, factor 11A inhibitor in patients with cancer. Uh, and so in the, they are up and running in the UK. Um, there is uh, the first trial, uh, 007, I like to call it, uh, abilazumab versus apixaban to treat acute VTE in patients um, it, with standard cancers. And then those patients in, in non-GU or GI tract. And then another trial um, looking at the same abilazumab compared to low molecular weight heparin and those with GI tract malignancies and GU tract mal malignancies that meet the eligibility criteria. You can contact Nancy Widener um, at Anthos um, if, for more information if you're interested in participating. So I'm now going to switch gears. Um, as we've seen, you know, uh, the first slide, the cartoon by Alok Karana and colleagues, there's a lot of downstream unwanted uh, effects uh, in patients' lives uh, who have cancer and cancer-associated VTE. Uh, we know, based on the data I've showed, that um, if you do have uh, a cancer-associated VTE, your risk of bleeding is higher uh, and what I didn't stress, of course, is that it's higher with any anticoagulant uh, compared to no anticoagulant. Uh, and so the question is, has come up, can we use primary prophylaxis to prevent VTE and, and, and to prevent a first VTE? We've known for over a decade uh, using uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, that uh, anticoagulants at prophylactic dose are effective. Uh, to decrease the risk of thrombosis. Trials with low molecular weight heparin, the Save Onco trial, the PROTEC trial, other trials uh, in um, specific cancer populations, such as pancreatic, show uh, at least a 50% risk reduction compared with placebo. In those early low molecular weight trials, uh, however, the absolute risk of VTE in unselected patient ca uh, patients with cancer populations is overall around 5%. And so it was felt to, to subject everybody to low molecular weight heparin to uh, get a risk reduction when the absolute risk is low was not um, warranted. Um, however, uh, in a new approach uh, to VTE prophylaxis, trials with 10A inhibitors uh, have selected patients for increased risk of VTE using a Corona risk assessment score of two or greater. And this is a, a, in information about the variables right here on the left that are uh, were found by Alok Karana and, and Gary Lyman and others to, to predict risk of cancer-associated VTE based on type of tumor and some simple lab values and BMI with zero having low risk, one to two uh, deemed intermediate risk for thrombosis and greater than three being high risk. And so you can see that this is how you add up the points and you can see the odds ratio based on the, the variable. Um, in a prospective follow-up of 819 patients, Chian Ai and colleagues then looked at the six, applied the KS score and looked at the six month cumulative VTE rates uh, and found uh, these differences here. So that if you had a Corona risk so score of three or greater, your risk at six months of having a VTE was 17%, whereas if you had a score of two, it was just over 9%. So this scoring system was used uh, for two primary prophylaxis trials with direct oral anticoagulants, the AVERT trial and the Cassini trial, which randomized both to, in both trials, prophylactic doses of apixaban or rivaroxaban versus placebo. There are some differences in trial design, and I'm happy to address those questions later. Um, they Both trials performed an ITT and a per-protocol evaluation. Apixaban was found to uh, be uh, have a statistically significant difference between uh, VTE uh, development, first VTE development, 
Cassini actually screened patients before randomization and found four and a half percent of the population actually had VTE. So this may actually affect their results. But when we look at number needed to treat, um, if we look at the entire ITT population, that's 17 to prevent one VTE. And if we look at patients who actually um, adhere to the per protocol uh, analysis requirements, that's only 11. 11 patients that are high risk by, based on corona or intermediate risk to prevent VTE. And uh, Giancarlo Agnelli uh, put together this great table looking at all the variables uh, in the ITT, the symptomatic VTE, and major bleeding. Uh, and so, you know, we have to look at the risk benefit analysis here. We, overall, um, you know, the number needed to treat 24 uh, to prevent one VTE when they are selected for increased risk of VTE based on a corona score of two or higher, and 77 to major for um to, to cause one major bleed. And so is that a beneficial risk benefit ratio? That is something the field needs to determine and decide. So um, apixaban and rivaroxaban are effective and safe for prevention of cancer associated VTE, especially when the patients actually take the anticoagulant. And in these trials that, would, that had duration of treatment for six months, the discontinuation rates were very high, even for placebo at 35 to 50%. And often they, so they were not stopped for bleeding, but simply that the patient no longer wished to, to take the drug. Um, different patient populations, uh, which we can dissect in Cassini versus Avert and different VTE uh, detection strategies affect the end results. Further analysis and study of individual cancer types should provide improved guidance uh, for use of primary prophylaxis in patients with cancer. And, and so yet when we talk to our medical oncologists today even, and I've been talking to a lot of them over the last six months, they don't use primary prophylaxis in standard you know, day-to-day -day clinical practice. Uh, again, the, the, it may be because the risk benefit analysis is often close as we saw from Giancarlo's um, uh, editorial uh, uh, table, uh, you know, 20, preventing one VTE at, by treating 24 versus causing one major bleed in 77 depends on how you look at that. But major bleeding was shown to be twice as high with the DOAC prophylaxis in both Avert and Cassini compared with placebo. And so clinicians are rightly concerned about bleeding risk. Patients are not aware of the VTE re VTE risk, and as we are in World Thrombosis Day um, mode right now, and World Thrombosis Day occurs on Friday, October 13th, we need to do a better job of making patients aware of their cancer diagnosis and the risk of VTE that accompanies uh, that. They are overwhelmed when they're first given a, a diagnosis of cancer, and there are so many details about the treatment that it's understandable that VTE risk gets lost in the shuffle. Uh, the oncology care team is rightly focused on cancer treatments. And so um, many are now looking at implementation science to try to help uh, with VTE risk awareness in the cancer population and risk uh, uh, assessment by patients themselves. Many, uh, a few institutions, not many yet, um, are building in electronic risk assessment scores uh, North American Thrombosis uh, Forum has a, a patient uh, toolkit that I helped uh, them develop for patients with cancer to identify their risks. World Thrombosis Day uh, has a number of resources on their homepage. Improved risk prediction may help with our ability to discriminate and detect who, who is at the highest risk um, and who would benefit. Uh, Ang Lee developed a modified corona risk assessment score um, that sort of expands this to include broader tumor types, uh, 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 accounts for stage of cancer disease, uh, advanced stage versus localized, and other VTE risk factors. This was published in JCO this past spring, uh, uh, this year, Journal of Clinical Oncology, as well as Andres Manoz and colleagues in Spain, had developed a risk prediction score incorporating known genetic risks for VTE. 
Both are new scores. They've been derived and validated in their local populations, and now they need to be uh, validated prospectively in other populations and perhaps used in primary VTE prophylaxis trials. For bleeding, this is where our focus needs to lie. Um, clinicians are afraid to give primary prophylaxis because of risk of bleeding. The current bleeding assessment scores do not do a good job for our patients with cancer. The HasBled score for major bleeding was developed for patients with atrial fibrillation taking vitamin K antagonists. And so even for DOACs, it's thought that the HasBled score is insufficient. Uh, there was a study looking at the current uh, scores that are out there, HasBled, Atria, Orbit, VTE bleed, uh, and AF bleeding scores uh, that have been applied to large databases um, and where only age in this analysis published in the Open Heart Journal in 2023 found that age and history of bleeding were shown uh, to have incremental prediction value. But uh, they summarize this nicely here. Some are looking at biomarkers such as Fritz Mulder and colleagues and perhaps growth differentiation factor uh, it may serve this role, although in discussions with him, this may simply be a marker for frailty affected by age uh, and comorbidities. Ander has uh, derived a new uh, BCAT score, um, which I did not have time to incorporate here, and I'm going to let him discuss this hopefully during our Q&A session. So in summary, 10A anticoagulants have demonstrated non-inferiority for treatment of VTE in patients with cancer-associated VTE, significantly simplifying the care for many. The bleeding risk, however, in patients with cancer-associated VTE is still concerning, potentially with some 10A inhibitors and potentially with the patient's individual tumor type and other comorbid processes. For some with a risk of mucosal bleeding, uh, low molecular weight heparins may still be a better option than DOAX, and it needs to have an individual patient assessment. Primary VTE prophylaxis is associated with significant efficacy, but in the trials that we saw in those patients with increased risk based on Corona score, they doubled the risk of major bleeding uh, and an even higher clinically relevant non-major bleeding risk. So the future holds promise for improved VTE risk prediction, improved bleeding risk prediction, and the potential for anticoagulants that may have decreased bleeding risk, such as the factor 11 inhibitors. So uh, in this uh, week of celebrating and recognizing and observing World Thrombosis Day uh, with our World Thrombosis Day uh, campaign, I want to end by saying <clears throat> that there is room for improvement. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Jean, for a, uh, a wonderful lecture. And on behalf of Thrombosis UK, uh, really appreciate you having such a, a, a detailed but very clear and astute summary of the literature where you presented to this World Thrombosis Day Masterclass. And uh, I think, um, you know, we couldn't have had a better example of discussing both uh, data in a erudite fashion, but also discussing how to manage difficult patients, how to how to handle complex cases, and particularly cases at high risk of bleeding or high risk of recurrence. So, uh, fantastic lecture, and Thank I you. want to remind everyone uh, who's with us today. And I can see that there's around a hundred people uh, joined us that there's an opportunity to ask Professor Connors uh, some question. And Professor Connor is um, someone we, we should, uh, well, take time to, to discuss any, any questions we have. There is one question uh, for you, Jean, which I, I'd like to put to you just for a start. And it really relates to using low molecular weight heparin when patients are thrombocytopenic. And uh, can, we, can we do it if the platelet counts 25 to 50? Can we do it if the platelet count is less than 25? And if so, what dose would you recommend? You know, that's an excellent question. And, and that's something we face in clinical practice uh, all the time. Um, 
the general consensus, and if you look at ISTH uh, guidance documents on this, if you look at the manuscript I wrote with with Hanny um, that that sort of reviews what's out there, the general consensus is that in any patient, you can use anticoagulation down to a platelet count of 50,000. After that, in, there are a lot of patient individual factors that come into play. But if they do not appear to have a high risk of bleeding, if they're not, you know, 90 years old with, with colon cancer, um, you can safely use anticoagulation between platelet count of 25 and 50,000. In that situation, it's recommended, though, to use about half dose of a low molecular weight heparin. Uh, and so for many, that might be one milligram per kilogram once a day, uh, say of a noxaparin, or 100 units per kilogram of daltaparin uh, once a day, rather than trying to use um, a twice a day regimen at a reduced dose. Because if there are patients with malignancy, um, doing twice a day injections gets difficult. When the platelet count is below 25,000, um, if you look at that flow chart in our manuscript, and what matters now is how acute is the thrombosis how life-threatening, and, and can you transfuse to get the platelet count higher with the expectation that in a few weeks, for example, the patient's recovering from chemotherapy, that the platelet count's going to be normal. In that situation, you can take any of those strategies. For example, if the platelet count's 10,000 and they have a line-associated clot from a, a, a PIC line, many people might just pull the catheter and observe um, and not treat with anticoagulants. But if it's a PE, as I alluded to, and they have a platelet count of 17,000, then in that situation, we recommend transfusing to maintain a, a platelet count around 50,000, knowing there's variability, and use uh, you know, one milligram per kilogram once a day of, an, of anoxaparin or the equivalent. Great. Thank you. So there's another very complex question, which I'll put to you. Uh, it's a patient with a luminal GI cancer. And uh, this particular cancer limits their ability to take oral anticoagulants. Does low molecular weight have a role if this patient has AF? So this is off the VTE track. This is more on the AF track, but clearly um, an interesting situation. You, you've got to manage a patient with atrial fibrillation, a luminal GI cancer. Can we use low molecular weight heparin? Yes. So, so the answer to that is actually yes, based on like old cardiology literature, right? Using a heparin anticoagulants. Ideally, we use a therapeutic dose uh, of the low molecular weight heparin to prevent stroke. And this issue actually comes up frequently in patients with mechanical valves, true mechanical valves that need ongoing anticoagulation to prevent stroke, which is maybe even a higher risk uh, than uh, atrial fibrillation, depending on the patient's individual factors. So yes, you can absolutely use low molecular weight heparin at therapeutic dose um, if DOACs are not an option because they have a large uh, friable um, uh, tumor uh, in the lumen. And, and we could have lots of discussions about, you know, which GI tract malignancies uh, give patients an increased risk for bleeding with DOACs, but the answer is yes. Great, thank you. And then uh, another question, looking into your crystal ball, um, and it's about factor 11 uh, inhibitors, or factor 11A inhibitors, but as we know, factor 11 inhibitors, some of them inhibit factor 11, some inhibit factor 11A, some like abelacilumab inhibits both. <laughs> so would they be beneficial for cancer associated thrombosis? What's your, what's your feeling? What's your gut feeling on that? Yeah, no, well, let me say we're optimistic. Uh, yeah. And I actually happen to sit on the, the steering committee. So two yeah. things, disclosures and advertising for abelacilumab in cancer-associated VTE. Well, well, well so um, do I. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that when I showed the slide, Ander. No problem. So, so you know, we are very, very optimistic. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of discussion. If you look back to that that uh, cartoon of the, the factors that um, precipitate thrombosis in patients with cancer that Chihan and colleagues developed, um, 
you know, the, the proof is going to be in in the pudding that they say, right? I mean, we, we need to see how, how it works um, because, you know, many of us are optimistic that anticoagulation might affect COVID, but that's a very different milieu. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think in patients with malignancy, um, we have great optimism that, yeah. that people will be affected. Agreed. It certainly looks good in uh, knee replacement when you look at the meta-analyses and things like that. So that's a, a good venous thrombosis model anyway. And uh, look, we're running out of time, uh, but if I could just uh, get your thoughts on one last thing and then we can wrap up. And uh, just to ask you quickly, you noted the clinically relevant non-major bleeding was increased and and, you know, it may be more important than we think it is. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I I, I, I completely agree with the sentiment right. that clinically relevant non-major bleeding is absolutely important. Um, I, I do run a, a, a cancer-associated um, anticoagulation management service with pharmacists, nurse practitioners, nurses, and they are constantly getting asked by patients about, um, you know, and, and providers um, can they hold their anticoagulation? They have nosebleeds, they have hematuria, they have rectal yeah. bleeding, um, yeah. they have bruising, they get significant bruising uh, on their extremities, uh, you know, they yeah. can't find an IV. So I absolutely think it is a factor that is a little harder to quantify. And so that's why a lot of attention hasn't been paid to it in the past. And also when we had VKA and heparin, we didn't have many choices. Uh, and so we were stuck. If someone needed anticoagulation, we had to accept yeah. the bleeding yeah. risk. Now, I, I think it's clear that this is an area that we need to hone into. And so I think factor 11 and factor 12 inhibitors may, may have significant benefits there. Well, well, Jean, wonderful, wonderful presentation and a fantastic discussion. It's been our privilege and honor to have you as our speaker at the Thrombosis UK World Thrombosis Day Masterclass. I think it's uh, such a treat to have an expert like you who's also a wonderful clinician and not only be able to talk about your clinical trial experience, but your clinical experience. So on behalf of all of us uh, who have joined the meeting, it's been a treat and thank you. And I look forward to seeing you at another meeting soon. Great, Under. thank you. And again, I wanna thank uh, Thrombosis UK for this opportunity. Um, take care. All the best.